Hosanna to the son of David, the king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The Lord be with you. And also with you. If you'd like to be seated. During the season of Holy Lent, we've been preparing to celebrate the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus by prayer, fasting, and acts of service. Today we come together to begin this celebration in union with the church throughout the world. Christ enters his own city to complete his work as our saviour, to suffer, to die and to rise again. So let us go with him in faith and love, so that united with him in his sufferings, we may share his risen life. If you'd like to hold up your palms with going to bless them, this symbol of God's faithfulness throughout the year and throughout the ages is wrought in a palm, that symbol of national celebration for the Jews, but also a reminder that on Palm Sunday, the people of God have often uh, not been as faithful as he has. Welcome, come on in. Girls, have you got a palm cross? Now's the time to raise it. You ready? Let us pray and let us bless them. God, our Saviour, whose Son, Jesus Christ, entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these palms be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So, let us pray for a closer union with Jesus Christ in his suffering 
and in his glory. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, grant us the faith to know that you, grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of the glory. Amen. As we proclaim Jesus as Lord and King, let us remember his good and perfect teaching. He said this, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The good news is that through Jesus' death, the symbol of which we have in this palm cross, we can find forgiveness for our sins if we confess them to him. So let us turn to God in penitence and faith. We pray to the one who knows our struggles, who knows our shortcomings, and loves us. So let us pray. Almighty God, Long suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess with my whole heart, my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts I've done to others, and the good I have left undone. O oh God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you and raise me to the newness of my life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We now have our readings from God's Holy Word. They can be found on your notice sheet on the inside on page two. The first reading comes from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoner of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading talks of Jesus a great image of the one who was perfect and equal with God, the Word made flesh, become human. It comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to hear one of the great Palm Sunday readings, let us stand to sing hymn number 139. Hymn number 139. decided to change our crowning with many crowns because when we did it last time the tune uh, left me thinking that we were trying to kick him off the throne rather than put him on the throne. I've learned something this morning along with all of you apparently there's two versions of that hymn. Uh, there, there could be more yes indeed yes let's not be too confident that there's only two uh, but the reality is um, do you know what when life gives you lemons let's make lemonade. Uh, there is a good example in that, in that, you know what, it doesn't matter how perfectly you try and worship God, um, our offering is never perfect. What matters is that we offer from our hearts. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that when it comes to the Easter services, I'll have the right tune and the right lyrics. Or at least I'm aiming for, yeah, good, exactly. But here is the reading, or one of the readings from the Gospels, that talk about Palm Sunday, what we remember as Palm Sunday. And the reading comes, the Gospel reading comes from cha on chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. So hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. 
Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard what he had done, that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. If you'd like to be seated. Heavenly Father, we pray as we come to look and listen to your holy word that you'd help us to grow in faith, help us to get a sense of how much we can trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Palm Sunday, or rather the events that led up to Palm Sunday, that inspire Palm Sunday, is perhaps one of the most energised moments in the Gospels. Possibly second only to Jesus himself as he is actually carrying the cross up to the place of his crucifixion, to his execution. And the same people, or some of the same people, that are here in this reading are also in that event. The same people that come and welcome him here and say, Hosanna, which means save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They are going to be saying in a few short days, crucify him. Kill him. Be done with him. Let him save himself. And we have in the Easter week, at both ends of it, energy, excitement, anticipation, heartbreak, disappointment, and of course in the resurrection, relief, hope. And at the first moment, confusion. We have in this one week, if you like, a whole roller coaster of getting it right a little bit, getting it wrong, then moving into, finally beginning to see the goodness of what God's doing. And so for us to understand all of this, and to help us insert ourselves into this, to help us grow, I want to look at the crowds to, to the most part. But the way I want to look at it is to help you see that God keeps his promises. That if there's one thing that you need to know about God, other than the fact that he loves you, and not in that sentimental sense of love that flips and flops, but in an abiding love, is that he keeps his promises. He's far more faithful, he's far more able than we can imagine. And that sometimes, actually, we skip a beat, we get ahead of ourselves, or we hope for something that he doesn't actually promise. But nonetheless, he is good. And so the background is this. At the time, Israel is under the Roman boot. You probably know, if you've heard the gospel stories before, that it's a Roman governor that finally gives the order to execute Jesus. There's all sorts of people at play. But the thing that the whole nation is feels burdened by is the fact that Israel is not free. In fact, Israel is not even called Israel. The Romans changed the name and called it Palestine because they wanted to make clear that Israel was a province, not a people. And so the Jews, the Israelites were struggling and they'd been promised by God that there would be a time when God would come and release them, that a king would come, not just any king, but God himself would come and restore to them freedom and hope and a future. 
Now imagine if you're there at this point and you hear that there's a guy called Jesus and he's doing phenomenal things. He's teaching with authority. He's healing people. And then you hear that he rose somebody from the dead. That's not foolish, is it? He raised somebody from the dead. Imagine that feeling and that sense. Hang on a minute. Could this be really it? Could this be what we're hoping for? Is now the time and you hear it and people you know have seen it. Your neighbour happened to be in Bethany at the time and they say, it really happened. I know that sounds too good to be true, but I was there. He was dead. Trust me, we could smell it. He needed a bit of a shower afterwards, but he went from death to life. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw the grave clothes come off. I saw the family weeping, and then I saw Jesus speak, and he was alive again, Lazarus. Now, have you ever seen when um, a football team brings the Premier League trophy back to a city? Have you ever seen that moment? Yeah, a few of you are nodding. Everybody turns up to celebrate. You know, if you're in Liverpool, um, I'm not sure quite what happens, whether the Everton team sort of stays at home when Liverpool bring it back. Um, I don't know what happens when there's a place where there's a derby. But if you go where there's one Premier League team, it feels like all of a sudden the whole town is out celebrating. All of a sudden everybody's a football fan. Everybody, oh yeah, I've been watching for years, I have. Or perhaps when, it, when the Queen, her, the, the late Queen, came to Preston to make, I'm a Prestonian by the way, uh, made, made us a city. Everybody came out to visit her. People who never even gave a second thought about the Queen. All of a sudden, we were lying in the streets, everybody was out, waving and screaming, really excited. Day before, they hadn't got a clue we'd become a city. But it hits the news, everybody's out celebrating. I'm not really sure what it did, by the way. Preston's still what it was, a big bus station that you can miss. But nonetheless, when the Queen came, everything changed. And so when Jesus comes here in this moment, the crowd that was with him saw him raise the dead. And the crowd that heard about it come out. And they cut palm branches, not in the shape of crosses, but just our way because it's a symbol of we're going to be free. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The energy, the excitement. And here, amongst it all, we see the first point for you this morning is this. God keeps his promises. Look to Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. This is verse 9 I'm reading to you again. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. Jesus turns up. He's lived a perfect life. He is the king. He's humble, mounted on a donkey. Check, check, check. And not only that, he's just raised Lazarus from the dead. If there's any more of a sign of salvation is coming, I'd say that's it. God keeps his promises. And so there are loads of promises that we have in the Bible that don't just apply to Jerusalem, that apply to us. The promise that if we turn to him in faith, it doesn't matter what we've done. If we turn to him, trust and follow, we are forgiven. And so much are we forgiven that the things that trouble us, we don't need to think about again. We can file them away. We can say, it is finished. It's been done. I don't need to rehash my shortcomings. I don't need to rehash my shame. I can trust the one who sorts it all. The promise that on the final day, those that are in faith will be risen from the dead. You'll be raised like Lazarus, but next time we won't die. These are promises that are for you. God keeps his promises. And yet, amongst the crowd and amongst the en energy, I've already signaled to you that perhaps it's not that simple. God keeps his promises. But, frankly, at times, we're really rubbish at listening to him. And you see, the same crowd, as I said, goes from crucifying to killing. They go within a week from crucifying to... Uh, sorry, not crucifying to killing. King to kill him. From... Save us that he can't save himself. How did they do that in a week? I mean, you know, if, if you just had the Premier League trophy turn up, you know, you might go back to work the next day. But if you just had a man who's raised people from the dead come to town, do you really flip that quickly? Well, the key is this. Look at verse 9. Humble and mounted on a donkey. 
Now, we see a donkey as a beast of burden. You think of, of a donkey often as perhaps something that's quite stupid, something you have to argue with. Most of the time when donkeys are in films or that kind of stuff, you often see somebody holding them like this and it's desperately going the other way. But to the Israelites in the ancient Near East, the donkey was the sign when somebody rode them towards a coronation was they were a sign of somebody that came in peace, not as a conqueror. And so the people who welcomed him, they wanted a bloke on a horse with a big stick to whack the Romans. In a nutshell, they wanted war and they wanted freedom. Jesus came to conquer something more important than the Romans. He came to raise us from the waterless pit. He came to offer the end to sin. And so they didn't get what they wanted. They didn't listen carefully, and so they were done with him. This one isn't who he claims to be. Of course, you have the resurrection a few days later, where I imagine there was a few people with egg on their faces, a few people somewhat embarrassed by the reality that they just said, the one that's risen from the dead, they wanted to kill him. But we can do the same, can't we? Have you ever used this phrase, if God really loves me, this wouldn't have happened? I hear sometimes of people that used to go to church and often somebody will, um, somebody in their family, they might lose a job maybe or somebody will die or there'll be a moment that they struggle with and as they do, they fall away. If God's really loved, why is that going to happen? I don't have a use for a God that's going to allow that. And so they slip away from church. They listen to half the promise and not the full promise. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you've got to walk through the valley. And what's the next line? For thou art, I, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The promise is he's with us. The promise is that, nothing, that is not that nothing bad happens. So as I come into land this morning, what am I trying to communicate to you? What is it that the scriptures, what's God trying to say to you this morning as we head towards Easter? He's trying to say, he's saying to you, I keep my promises. <coughs> my promises are immutable. My character is sure. But please listen to the words that I speak to you. I promise not to forsake you. But I don't promise that your life will be perfect. I promise that in the world to come and in the age to come, that's when perfection will be. And so what can we do? How do we grow in faith? How do we understand more? I love this final verse that I'm going to share with you from this reading. Verse 16 of the Gospel. Look at this. Especially after I got the hymn wrong, I feel quite, this, this makes me feel even better this morning. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him, the invitation in the Christian faith is not to have it all sorted from the get-go. The invitation is to know the one who will sort it from the get-go. And so um, I know many of you have been uh, buying or gifting Bibles to one another and are beginning to read them and beginning to uh, find that actually it's not quite this strange book as you first thought. That's a great encouragement to me and I want it to be an encouragement to you. Because the way we stand firm on the promises is knowing the promises and praying the promises. And so as we come into Easter, I hope and I pray that you hear the promises of fresh this year. The promises of forgiveness. The promises of hope. The promises of spiritual health. Because the King has come and the King will come again for you for those who are of faith. Amen. <coughs> the Apostles' Creed sums up all of the uh, wonderful realities of what God has done and continues to do. And so can I encourage you to stand as we recite it? If this is your faith, let me encourage you to say it boldly. If you're on the journey of faith, maybe you want.
themselves listen to the words and make a mental note of the things that may puzzle you or excite you. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered from the Let us with confidence present our prayers and supplications to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. Let us sit or kneel to pray. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Heavenly Father, we pray who we know, perhaps for ourselves, who have heard half of, half of a promise or have heard something about you, an echo or a gossip of who you are and then have been disappointed because they put their hope not in you but in sort of a, an echo or a half of you. We pray for those who have been disappointed when You've not acted in the way that they hoped or expected. And we pray for them that they would be, Father, by your spirit, brought back to you, restored to hope, that the true promises that you offer to them of forgiveness, of love, of an end to shame, of the promise to be with them. Father, we pray that they would come to trust and believe them and be renewed in spiritual life. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Father, we pray for, for all those little ones amongst us, all those children that are part of the church family. Father, we pray that as they grow, they may understand the truths of your word. That as they, at the moment, are too young to grasp the promises for themselves, that we as your church would be able to help them, guide them into a full and adult faith. That they may know the joy of your presence in the happy times and in the sad. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who can't be with us because their body is not as well as they would hope. We pray for those that suffer in mind, body and spirit, that you would comfort them, that you would draw near to them, that you would bring healing to them. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Finally, Father, as we head on the journey to Easter Sunday, as we move through Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and ultimately to the celebration of the resurrection. Father, we pray that we would grow in faith, that each one of us would see more of your promise, more of who you are. That when we gather here in a week to come, that we would all be able to, to be celebrating the reality of the resurrection and the life that has been promised to us. Finally, as we think of that day, we pray for Liam and Chloe as they prepare for their baptism. Father, we give you thanks and praise that you have worked wonderful things in their life. And we pray that it would be a day of celebration. And echoing one of their prayers yesterday, we pray 
their friends and family that don't know you will be interested and come to know you for their good and for your glory. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. talking about promises this morning and as we begin to look to the Lord's table here is another promise once we were far off but now in union with Jesus Christ we've been brought near through the shedding of his blood for he is our peace and so the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you let us offer one another a sign of peace to you all. We stand and sing hymn number 17, which I've not tinkered with, so it should, no, I'm not sure at this point. I haven't tinkered with it, so it should be tickety boo. Uh, hymn number 17. <laughs>
The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. So lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. If you like to sit for a meal. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in your glory. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And so let us pray with confidence, as our King and Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. This is a table of blessing. If you have been baptised um, and are hoping for confirmation, or of course you have already been confirmed, you are most welcome to come and receive the, the wonderful gifts of Jesus' body and his blood, this bread, this wine. And if you're not yet there yet, if you've not been baptised, um, Jesus wants to bless you anyway. And so if you want to come forward to bring maybe your service sheet with you, uh, you're welcome and I would love to be able to pray God's blessing over you. So draw near with faith. For those of you that are baptised, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Most merciful Father, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we and the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Before we have our blessing and the final hymn, just a few notices very quickly. Uh, you can probably guess what the notices are. Um, you don't need to be a mind reader to guess. I'm going to be talking about Easter. Uh, on the back of your notice sheet, you can see all of the services between now and Easter Sunday on the 31st of March. So on the next service um, actually will be 4 o'clock this evening, as always, uh, in the historic church. Uh, time together to pray and to reflect. That's at four o'clock. And then on Monday, Thursday, we have the Eucharist of the Last Supper at 7 p.m. That's there in the historic church. And that's followed by the watch. That service effectively sort of, if I was saying that it peters out, that's the wrong sense, but the sort of, uh, for those of you that are musicians, there's sort of the innuendo into the silence and the anticipation of watching with Jesus and praying. It's a wonderful time to uh, receive and see the love of Jesus and then sit in quietness, receiving, reflecting and looking forward to the wonder and the mystery of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The following day, Good Friday, there are two services. We've got Stations of the Cross with Hot Cross Buns at St Richard's. That's at 10.30 a.m. Um, and that is, as we are, are effectively, we walk around the church, for those of you that never experienced this, we walk around the church and we stop pretty much at every point of Jesus' journey where he moves from being condemned to death to giving his life for us. And we reflect and we pray and then we celebrate that uh, with hot cross buns. Three o'clock is the liturgy of Good Friday where we do indeed actually commemorate and celebrate Jesus' death. That's at 3 p.m. on Good Friday here at St. Helen's Historic Church. And then moving into uh, Easter Sunday itself, peculiarly it begins at sundown on Holy Saturday, the great Easter vigil with uh, smells and light, uh, scent and sound. Um, the celebration of the reality that death is defeated. We don't need to go through the wonder and the mystery of the disciples uh, wondering if their Messiah, their teacher and friend had died, what's going to happen? We already know. It's not like it's a mystery what happens. But at that great Easter vigil, we feel, celebrate and thank him with the impact of all of that. And then Easter Sunday, we have... Uh, just Easter Sunday is always great. We celebrate the fact that in Christ we're alive. We ain't going to die. Well, we will die, but we'll be raised from the dead. And this Easter Sunday we have uh, a double celebration, really, in that Chloe and Liam will be baptised. Uh, Chloe and Liam, you may know, um, they often come on Sunday morning, but for various family circumstances, they're, they're often at 4 p.m. And they're in their 20s. And they've come from no faith whatsoever to a real living faith. And so we're going to baptise them on Easter Sunday morning. And then we're going to begin uh, and continue with the pattern of Easter evening prayer at four o'clock on Easter Sunday as well. So I hope my encouragement and my invitation to you is to literally come to all of it. Come and celebrate and have your hearts and minds formed by the reality of what Jesus has done in history and offers us today. But if you're not able to make it all because life does happen and get in the way, come to as much as you can and celebrate the fact that you can live because he died and rose again. With that in mind, oh, I nearly did forget. I did nearly forget. At the back, we have um, a mystery offered uh, left in church sometime last week. 
called Sheila. Sheila, if you're watching, there was no surname, so I'm not able to thank you uh, better than that. But there are a small selection of handmade Easter cards. If after the blessing you want to stampede over there, I think, from my understanding of how they were left, they're a gift to us to then send to people. Um, sharpen your elbows, get there first, and then there is uh, tea, coffee uh, to follow. Um, I think that's... There's no cake. I, I have this horrible neck that I've forgotten. Um, so if your tea and coffee and merriment is disrupted by my northern voice again, uh, you'll know I've remembered as I process out. But nonetheless, in anticipation of Jesus' death, his resurrection and our life, let us stand to receive God's blessing. Friends, may Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, and to take up your cross and follow him. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. There is indeed tea, coffee, and time together. But when you go off into this holy week, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 608. Hymn number 608. And I've just remembered what the final thing was. There are palm crosses. If you want to take them for friends and family, there are palm crosses in the back. Hymn number 608.